Hello, everybody, and welcome to another question and answer session. Today, we are live with Jolt Ola, and we're talking about how to go beyond storyline using modern web languages like JavaScript. So before we bring Jolt up, I want to give him a quick introduction and just talk about how I came to know him and got introduced to his work. Um, so let me let me share my screen just so we can look at a few things here because I, Jolt has been in this space for like 20 years doing instructional design and technical e-learning development work. And for about 15 years now, he's been on the leadership side of things, doing a lot of like technical learning consulting. And he's known for like this very technical work um, early on. So like a, a year or two when I like being in the industry, I was talking to a potential client about doing some technical work and it was at a company Jolt had worked at. And he's like, do you know Jolt Ola? Like you remind me of a, of a young Jolt, <laughs> which I took as like a huge compliment just because the very first time I like used JavaScript in Storyline, I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. I didn't know anything about JavaScript. And I came across this tutorial from Jolt and I was able to do something per, what I thought was pretty cool. Um, so let me just share my screen. So I was, this is when I was a master's student. I was just making this like storyline project. This person's throwing like some vegan dinner party and it's your job to identify these like vegan food items. So I built this game with a tool called Construct3, which is like a completely separate tool to make games. And then you just embed it as a web object in storyline. So that part was all, all fine, but I wanted them to be able to talk to each other so that once you like collected 25 of these items, it would just bring you to the next slide in storyline. So I was thinking like, oh, this is going to be impossible. But with, with Joel's tutorial, I was able to figure it out. So once you like collect the right number of these, you know, cause this, this is like randomly generated how these are falling. It, it's pretty cool that tool, that construct three tool. But once you get the right amount of these, it will just kind of jump to the next slide. So that for me, I was like so happy when I was first writing this write up. I was like, I use JavaScript. I use this tutorial. I was like, I'm, I'm a technical mastermind, <laughs> but really it was just from following Joel's tutorial. So really cool stuff. Since then, he, he eventually he created this pop 99 resource, which is like this full library of how you can use JavaScript on e-learning development projects. So particularly with Storyline and um, Articulate Rise. So I know, I know it hasn't been updated in a, in a little bit, but I added a question to the queue for Joel to tell us more about this. So just upvote that one if you wanna learn more. I shared this link too beneath this video you're watching right now. It's just an intro to JavaScript that Jolt created. So I was like cracking up at this video. It was like really funny, um, just good stuff here. And we're gonna dive into, into much more. So let's welcome Jolt up. We, yeah, and you can see from the turnout, I mean, this, this is a great guest. He's currently a digital of learning. I want to, I want to say the right thing. Digital learning and experience at Amazon Web Services. So welcome, Joel. Thanks for joining us today. I know we were all very excited to hear from you today. Thank you so much for having me. And it looks like we have people from all over the world. So it's actually a real hello world um, sort of thing. So <laughs> hello, everyone. All right. Hello, everyone. So Joel, maybe to get us started before we dive into these questions, can you tell us a bit more about how you came into this really technical side of things, doing this technical e-learning work, and maybe more generally why we're talking about JavaScript and Storyline today? Like, why is it important? Yeah, sure. So I think if nothing else, um, uh, and you want to drop in five minutes and you want one little piece of takeaway is that you never should listen to anybody, including me or other experts of what you should be doing in your life and career, because it's you, you have your own project, your restrictions and, and everything else. So for my goal here today is almost just ask the right questions and then have you um, answer your own, whether you should or should not. Um, export JavaScript or other um, languages at all. So where where this comes from, I'm originally from Hungary. So anybody who's uh, here from Hungary, hello. Um, back in the days, I completed my um, master's degree in computer science. This is where my first learned languages like C++ um, and then dabbled into all kinds of things from PHP to um, Perl and of course JavaScript and Java later on. Um, I'd never been a programmer. 
So it is not my um, you know, nine to five job to, to write code. It was always in some sort of a project um, that I wanted to, to solve. So this is how the, the technical side of, of, uh, of myself came in. And then the second degree that I completed was actually instructional design and learning. And uh, it was a great combination. And ever since, um, I basically can confuse everyone on a call because I can dive into an engineering coding session and all the way up to let's talk to the client who think they know what they want and that's not what they need. And this is, I think, a good segue to, to answer your question, Devlin, of why even we're talking about um, JavaScript. Um, because when you use Storyline, and most sessions will be about Storyline, when you use Storyline, you often have these questions from clients, can you do X in Storyline? And if the, if the platform doesn't do it, your answer would be no. Now, I think a good suggestion is always turn this question into a slightly different angle. So instead of saying no, you can ask them, tell me what you're trying to achieve through X. And then we'll see if it's doable and then whether it's worth it. Because this turns into you into a consultant and now the client feels like didn't just get a no, but explain what they want. And most of the time, and if you've been in the industry for a while, you um, probably um, testament that that they they come to you with a solution that they think they need. And it's most of the time, it's not actually what they need. That's what they want and you need to move forward. And so JavaScript comes in as a extra almost tool in the box that you can say, hey, out of the box, it may not do it, but we can do extra, but we need to decide together whether it's worth it or not. I love it. Okay. So so first piece, yeah, you you have a computer science degree. I know some people in the audience might be like, well, I don't have, I sure don't have a computer science degree. So am I ever going to be where, where Jolt's at with all of this? So just hopefully I can provide a little bit of a different perspective on some of these things. My undergraduate degree is in English literature. I didn't know any coding. I, I never touched it until getting into this field, found out I really liked the technical side of things. And I just all self-taught online. And, and I like that you brought up the next piece. Like it's not just sitting in a room coding for eight hours a day. Like, it sounds like you really emphasize that client communication piece, like they go hand in hand. And that's been my experience and why I really like this technical side of things. Because like you said, it's not, oh, this isn't possible. It's if the price is right, I can do this with custom code. That's how a lot, some of my client conversations go. And those are some of my most profitable projects. So um, yeah, it will be exciting to talk about this. And I know some people will be curious about how to learn more about about JavaScript and how to get started. And we're going to dive into that question a little later. And just a, just a note on that, Davon. So yes, you don't need a degree in computer science to, to start coding and, and programming. Um, and on, on top of that, it, it's almost like asking why you would want to learn a sport or uh, an instrument if you don't want to be a professional. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, nobody would actually pick up an instrument then. Nice, good point. Right. Yeah. You don't need to like, I mean, and how I think about this sometimes too, is like, I think compared to like most e-learning developers, like my JavaScript skills are like up here, but like compared to like software engineers, I'm like down here. Yep. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, you can do some really cool stuff with Storyline, but when it comes to like building custom full stack web apps, it's like, I'm still kind of a, a newbie. So good to put that into perspective. So let's get started with the second most upvoted question here, which is, we want to know about some of these custom learning experiences you've developed that wouldn't be possible without custom code. And I know you've probably worked on many of them over the years, ranging from simple things like, you know, bringing in the person's name from the LMS or telling us what time of day it is or day of the week it is to some really complex things like a, like a link you shared with me about how we're like evaluating open text responses, like on the fly with code. So I'm sure we want to hear about a few of these. Like, I know that's what a lot of us are here for. So let's start with, whatever, pro you know, just tell us a bit about some of these projects. Sure. Um, so I think when you think about Storyline, um, I want to make sure that we all on the same page that you should not start with JavaScript if you don't know how to use Storyline. So you have to be able to use triggers, conditions, that sort of thing. So your first project probably not going to be any of this that we're talking about today. However, it's good to think about what the future is and what the vision is, and you can, um, you know, move 
forward with that. So I think I, I like to think about these in layers. So the first layer of JavaScript is when you can actually do the same in Storyline, but it makes it easier or faster. Um, so things like uh, manipulating variables. In JavaScript, um, you can directly access those variables that you have and make it make a lot easier decisions based on their numbers or add text together, that sort of thing that you could physically able to do that in Storyline too, but it would lots of lots of triggers and you have to scroll all the way down. So that's how usually people start yes. with of like, how do I add two strings together? And then maybe look at the number and based on the number, um, I change other variables. The second layer of this is that you cannot do in Storyline, but it would be good to have things like date, uh, math functions. So you can figure out what time of the day it is and greet your you know, learners like, hey, based on the server they are, of this is night or a day. Um, you can also time that and save that timing so you can have maybe a timeline of where they landed, that sort of things. Also, math random generator is one of the big things that everybody wants to use. Um, Storyline used to not have a random number, but even now, it is basically a one-time thing. So when you start, you get a random number. But if you want like a simulation of a dice, for example, then it's a simple one-line code and now you have a random number sort of thing. And then you cannot do that with that storyline. And then you get into the bubble of, okay, these are simple things, one line of codes, um, but what else I can do that's different? Um, the most common thing that I'm, ask, I'm asked is about communication with the LMS. So let's say I have um, variables that I wanna save and or interactions I wanna save and send it to the LMS and then retrieve them. So for example, to give you an actual example, we have a project now that we're working on and uh, we wanted to show a video. Throughout the video, um, anytime you can select the button, it's so up, basically thumbs up, thumbs down to indicate whether you're really interested in this part or you have questions around it. And then with SCORM 2004, we simply um, use this with JavaScript and store them. So we can make a, basically a report after that and aggregate of where are the, the um, content in the video that people are more interested in and then follow up with them. And you don't need XAPI, you don't need anything crazy around it. You can simply do that with a normal LMS that supports um, SCORM 2004. But you do need a little bit of a JavaScript um, scribbling there. Nice. Okay. So before we dive deeper, quick recap. So the first, and it seems, sounds like you're saying the most basic layer is just to automate the things you're already doing with triggers, but to vastly reduce the number of triggers. And that was one of my early, early storyline and JavaScript projects too. I had this like Likert scale type interaction with like six rows and like a total and like clicking each one would like affect all these other things. So I was thinking, I'm like doing this with triggers. I need like three triggers per button. Like it's, yeah, it's going to be like hundreds of triggers on this slide. But then I was like, with JavaScript, this would I could just do one trigger for each of these and it would be much more simple. So that's what you're talking about, right? You just need an execute JavaScript trigger instead of like three to 10 other triggers. You can just do it all in a couple lines of code once you know how to grab those variables and manipulate them. So good stuff. And then the second piece you said was just the simple one lines of JavaScript. You can find them on a Google search, find them on the forums, just how to grab things that are very readily available in JavaScript and then bringing them into the course just for maybe a, a little tad of personalization, the random number generator is good stuff. And then third, these are like the, well, data collection actually is what you got into with that, right? So yeah, you can collect data. That's so that's you're, 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 you're diving into the SCORM documentation, you know SCORM really well. Um, you can do similar things with XAPI. Like once you use JavaScript, you can, you can send data where you want to the LMS, to a learning record store, to a Google sheet. You can kind of track anything you'd like from an e-learning course, like any clicks, any text inputs. That stuff is pretty exciting. Um, I'm sure there are more, th there, there are like categorically different types of experiences that you can develop too though, once you can bring JavaScript into the mix. And a couple of things I'm thinking of, maybe you want to elaborate on them. Like one, you can also bring data like back into the projects. Don't know if you've worked on many like that, but you know, we can show dashboards and things like that. But then also like making multiple tools work together, like the construct three, for example, like other HTML th five things that you're embedding in this program, like VR experiences, you can embed and have them talking back and forth. 
Um, yeah, so this is actually the next layer of now you're not just controlling um, things inside uh, Storyline, but you actually reach out to through APIs. So things simple like if you're using YouTube videos, for example, nice. um, you can embed a YouTube video and control literally through their API of when and what to watch. Um, you can check how much they watch, all kinds of things um, through the two. So it's almost like a seamless experience with that. The same way that you can put in a, in a game um, inside, and if you pick up a key in the game, that you can use that key later on to open a door and learn more about it. That nice. sort of things you can um, play with it. I also have to mention that when, once you get more and more involved in these uh, different tools, you also have to be aware of of how this affects accessibility so sometimes throwing things on the screen just because you can doesn't mean that you should so you just have to make sure that the game itself for example is accessible and you yeah it's it, it is doable it's just you need to be aware of those elements good point and then um and then you can expand it to a little more so now you have almost uh, a product level or software program level um, things that you can customize. So one of the examples I have here is when I joined AWS, um, I need to learn about the software and um, services that they have. They have a vast amount of, of uh, things on AWS. And so I built for myself a little quiz and it has three layers. The first one is simply a multiple choice question and you answer uh, what is um, Elasticsearch? And then you select the uh, the answer. So this is like the basic thing. Second level, what I was interested in, how can I actually um, use a recall, which is a lot more stickier, obviously, we all know learning wise than selecting the right answer, which is most of the time the longest answer. Um, and so for that, uh, what, what we built is um, it shows you the you know, elastic search and then a simple open box. Now you have to recall, you have to actually type in what is the definition for elastic search. When you submit it, JavaScript actually runs um, an algorithm called Sorens and Dice and brings back a comparison between what you typed in and what the actual right answer is in paragraph. And it's a number between zero and one. So now actually what you can do is based on where you land, if it's really, really not what you wanted, you can give them a feedback like, hey, let's learn about this because it's not right. If it's really close, then you can show that. So in my example, what I did was you type in the answer, push it in, and it runs through about 40, 50 different definitions and find the four that's closest to what you typed in wow. and present it as a multiple choice. The funny thing is about it is all dynamic. So there's nothing hard coded in that quiz. It's one single screen and it all change depending on what you type in. So that's available only if you actually build a, a logic around it and then use it with, with Storyline. But it's on the horizon. It's effective. Okay. Okay, so help us help us fully understand this, right? So you're saying multiple choice questions, those are fine and all, but we're just saying, yeah, can you identify this? Is your short-term memory working? Does this look familiar, right? You're saying, we want to go a step beyond this. We want them to actually recall the information, try to type out that definition in their own words. Let's see how close they get to the real thing. In most cases, you know, most e-learning developers, it's we'll have them type in a response, we'll show them the right response, and we'll say, okay, you compare the two but you are like, we can do better than that, right? We can build this AI. <laughs> we can build some algorithm that will, that will parse this and see how close it is to the right definition. So I'm with you through there, but you said it runs through like 40 or 50 definitions and then presents it as a multiple choice. What it, can you explain more about that piece? Yeah, so um, imagine that you have 40 different products. Um, in, in this case, AWS has, um, different products and services. And they all have obviously a title and a definition. You can um, create a actual text file with all these. We used XML for that. So it's all in one file and no hard coded part. It's just that there. when the storyline loads yeah. this, um, it's all available in the memory. So right. When you type in what the definition is, what it does is takes that definition and run through every single item in that 40 definition and compares this 
And this number comes again back in between one and zero and one. And we picks the four that's closest to what you typed in oh. and presents those as options now. So basically what it says, you meant this. I don't have this exactly as you said, but here are four things that's very close. Which one did you mean? I see. So not only are you saying, yeah, that you didn't get this right, right? Like you didn't get it, but you explained this other, you explained something else. Which one of these four were you talking about? Okay, okay, nice. So you're really trying to draw those connections for people. And yeah, you're using this algorithm to make it's, that happen. And it's a double work because one is you need to think about it. You have to type it in, which is recall, the hardest to do for your brain, which we all know uh, works well for, for recall. But then after that, you can relax because now you can see options um, and you can select the right option if you type in the right thing. So you can measure how many right choices you have which would be your normal measurement. But you can also measure, aggregate how close you got to those by typing in the right answer. So you get two numbers at the end. One is how many you got right. Let's say you got 80% of them right. But you also get a number of how proficient were you recalling them. Right. And now you have a much grainer um, analysis of you can say, yeah, you passed it, but you were barely close to what they actually are. And yeah, you of... passed it, but you're not going to really do a great job explaining them to someone else <laughs> yeah. from memory. Good. That's, that's really, and so it's basically just looking for the exact words. Is that the level of complexity? Cause you're not looking at like synonyms, right? Like that seems like it'd be kind of crazy. <laughs> no. So this was not a uh, semantic analysis of uh, if you write one word and 5,000 other words can mean the same thing. Um, it, it, this algorithm is available now and you can look it up. It's Sorensen Dice. Um, it is basically connecting or comparing two texts, uh, not just words. So it's not like, did you type the right word here and right there? It has a little more sophisticated by characters and distance and that sort of thing. Now that was a couple of years ago when I did that. Today, AWS, on the AWS market, you can actually have a service if you want to sign up. Uh, an AI service that you send to text and it sends back you the um, comparison of how close they are. So you could use that. True. Okay. Yeah. That, that That's nice. So you just use like an API, basically send the response, get back. To yeah, the you could do comparison. that. Nice. So I see Don here mentioned this magic virus project. It uses JavaScript from you and others. I'm not familiar with that. Is that something that you wanted, like, is that an example you wanted to talk about or is that use any uh, cool JavaScript? I've never heard of it. Oh, so I don't know what that is, but if they're using oh, it, okay. it's great. Okay. Maybe, <laughs> maybe your JavaScript was just used without, yeah, just from one of your tutorials or resources. Okay. I see. And so, um, it's a, I think it's a good segue just to talk about that pop 99 thing that, yeah. that happened. So I started publishing these snippets of things, uh, of what you can do with, with JavaScript. And then I was also speaking at conferences when we had advanced sessions of uh, people actually doing things. And everybody asked me where the book is. And I was like, we don't have a book on this. Like it's a programming language. It's, it doesn't need a book. It's like, you just need live things to, to play with. And after a while I was like, okay, let's make a book that's kind of a book. And this is how the project um, 99 happened it was just not me it was um several others there's a page for acknowledgement of who contributed to that but we started collecting one place all the little things that you can do with with um, javascript in storyline and rise grab them as is as the code put it into your storyline and then and then run with it so i'm a big proponent of tinkering pick an example put it in see how it works and start taking it apart and adjusting it for your needs. Perfect. Yeah. And that's, that's how I got started with it and excited about it too. Like I said, seeing that early tutorial, here's how to make these two things talk. I was blown away. I was looking at the code. I'm like, this is literally like a foreign language to me. I have no idea what this is saying, but it works somehow. <laughs> and I remember when I was troubleshooting, I was like, probably doing things that were just completely fruitless because I didn't know how it all works. So it is, I think that's a cool place to start like with pop 99. And I know I saw it was updated in January of 2020, so coming up on a year and a half. And I know it, um, some of those use like jQuery and Storyline doesn't have that like built in anymore, like by default. So I think you were saying some of those things may not be up to date, but some of them 
for sure still work, right? Yeah. So before we get into two technical things of what all these uh, definitions throwing out, um, there was a good question down here. I saw what are the limitations? So what are we should be aware of? So one is if you do if you use the app. So when you storyline, you 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 can obviously um, export it into HTML um, five. You can have go to the LMS, this form, and XAPI, all that. But if you do use the app, I never used in my life the app. But if you use it inside an app, um, then JavaScript is not going to work. Um, if you use an LMS that serves the app, then it depends on the LMS. So you just mm -hmm. test it. Uh, most of them are fine with basic things. So that's another layer of, of testing if it actually happens to be in, a, uh, in an app. Otherwise, JavaScript, and this is why the reason JavaScript is, is so popular, um, that it doesn't need anything. It's in your browser. In fact, actually, if you right-click here and do like uh, inspect, um, you would see all kinds of crazy quick scracks. Yeah. Um, and there's a console, which is your biggest friend when you can type in anything and it works. Um, it just interprets automatically what JavaScript is. Yeah, yeah, so you're referring to the, the web browser's console. It's tough when you're starting out because you don't know about all these like workflow things and environment things that you can yeah. use for like troubleshooting and testing your code. So I know I know there are some JavaScript developers here, but I think most people here are probably never written a line of JavaScript in their lives. So we probably shouldn't get too technical here. But yeah, there are just make make use of the console as early as you can when you're getting started with JavaScript. It's a lifesaver, especially when it comes to troubleshooting. And so with that, I think, how do you start this whole JavaScript thing? So the first thing I say to everyone is where you're not starting. And where you don't want to start with is the little box in uh, the little white box as a trigger in Storyline. Yeah. <laughs> that is not where you code. Um, so if you never use JavaScript, you know that there are triggers, and you can add the trigger, and it basically puts you into the little box, the white box. There is no nothing in that box that supports JavaScript. And this is where Articulate ends. They say, if you put something here, we run it. But it's up to you to make sure that it actually functions. So that's not where you start coding. Once everything is working outside, you can plug it in, and then good for that. But don't start typing in things inside that little box and, and, and try to make it work. Yeah, so like Visual Studio Code, is that, do you use that tool? That's the tool I use for writing JavaScript. Yeah, so if you go to the POP99, is actually, it starts with this, like literally explains how the browser works. Um, how do you get nice. to, without any tools, just how do you get to your console and type in and get to actually change your variables straight from the browser, uh, which sometimes, um, people say like, well, this is a magic I've never yeah. seen. Is like, yes, literally you can, in the console, you can go in and change variables in Storyline on the fly. So there's ex explanation of, of how to start that. Um, as far as tools, at least you have to have Note, Notepad++. So this is like the minimum. Um, yeah. But um, Visual Studio is a good one. Um, um, Sublime Text is a good one. Yep. That that you want to use again. These are not overkills like Eclipse and and other things that people use for p actual software development. It's good enough to have the syntax, and you can show exactly you know color wise of of how it works. That's yeah. one. And the other thing that I would definitely suggest is start playing with um, like JS Fiddle, which is uh, literally just you can go to online and type in JS Fiddle. Uh, com. And what this gives you is actually a screen. When you have JavaScript, you can type in your code. You can have a CSS, which is tells you what a page looks like, colors and that sort of things, layout. And you can have the HTML, which is your content. And then you can run those right there and fix things and see how the three work together. Nice, okay, right. And for people who are pretty new, HTML, that's the structure of your web page, basically. That's the elements that are included. The CSS, that is how to style those elements, how to make them look pretty, you know, spacing, borders, color, all of that. And then the JavaScript is how you can like make that interactive, make that respond to different user variables and things like that. So yeah, tools like JS Fiddle, 
you can you can use JavaScript to modify those things, and you can see it all update like on the fly. So it kind of saves you from having to like get this whole environment set up and running on your computer. You can just use it right in the browser, focus only on the JavaScript, and see what it does to your web page. So good suggestion. Um, I thought it might be helpful if I just share my screen. We keep talking about the console. I think it would be nice to maybe show people what we're referring to. So in most cases, if you just right click anywhere on the screen and go to inspect, you can go to this console tab right here. And this is where you can execute JavaScript. So if we do like console.log, hello world, it will just, that, that's why it, you, you might've seen this before, console.log. It's literally saying log this to the console. <laughs> and so, and that's, and that's where it will appear. So when you're like writing code and troubleshooting, you can use these console.logs to like, see if your code makes it up to that point. You can log different variables and see if they're equal to what you expect them to be equal to. Again, we're not getting technical here. This is just a primer. We're talking about the console a lot and you'll see errors here too, if you know, things go wrong. So it's invaluable for troubleshooting. And this is where Jolt is saying, you can open up a storyline course, open up the console, and then you can start, um, modifying those variables right here from the browser. That's where you can start to see some of the magic of JavaScript, so to speak. So great suggestion. What so else? One thing that uh, I wanted to mention, because there, there was um, a big uproar here a couple of uh, days ago when I posted that, um, yes, you can go in and complete yes. the course um, in that console, literally in three lines of code, yep. you can complete your e-learning course. And then your LMS says, yep, you're done. Yep. Um, it may or may not work depending on uh, on your e-learning course how it was created, but most of the time you can technically, if you know what to type in, you can open up your course, the console, type in to send the completion, send the score, and then the LMS is gonna just say, "Yep, you're done," and you yep. never ever went through any other course. You're done. Yeah, because that's... so this is what JavaScript does. It's kind mm -hmm. of magic. <laughs> Yeah, because that's how that's how the course is communicating to the LMS already. It's using JavaScript. So all you do, write those few lines, commit the score, and there you go. It registers on the back end, 100% complete. I thought about that when I first learned that. I'm like, does that mean you can literally, you know, all scoring packages are just a couple lines of code away from 100%? <laughs> it's kind of so. Yeah. I saw people asking for a tutorial. Maybe you should throw that one together. <laughs> um, but uh, let's make sure that we step back one again because um, – a little higher. We 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 mentioned this. This is not a technical course of what to type in and how to how to work. Um, so one thing is, do you really need JavaScript at all? So you can be an e-learning developer happily ever after without touching any of those uh, lines. You, I'm sure there are probably 60, 70 percent of people out there who, if they need something, they actually go to someone who knows how to do that like me or others and ask for help. So you don't have to just for the sake of, uh, of, of getting a job because once you actually do that and you claim that you have JavaScript experience, you might actually get a job and now you have to use it. And if you don't like it, then it's basically a, a trap. But one thing I definitely want to make sure, whether it's JavaScript or any other um, programming languages, it's not the code um, that's so important, I think, um, for everyone, but more like the way programmers think uh, of how you can see a complex problem and take it apart into smaller chunks all the way down to the, the individual isolated things um, that in, in, uh, in a code, it might be like a function sort of thing. So you really, you can re reconstruct and then reconstruct those problems both for troubleshooting and then for building. That itself, it can be used not only in storyline when you use triggers and all that, it can be troubleshooting, but in, in real life, every um, problem that you're gonna face with clients is the same as there's this complex thing. You have to take it apart, um, reconstruct maybe um, smaller chunks and solve those and see the whole system. And this is how you learn after a while, it doesn't matter which programming language you use, you start thinking like that in real life too, as a programmer. Nice, okay, so you're saying it's not just the language you know, it's not just the syntax, it's, it's the thinking you're applying to the problem. How are you thinking through this? It seems like you need to know what your tools are capable of, right? Like what tools do you have at your disposal? What can they accomplish? But 
with all of that in mind, how are you helping yeah. solve this real problem? Not only on the on the technical level, how are we making this thing technically possible, but also you're saying you just start seeing it in your life overall. How are we solving this performance problem or this organizational problem? <clears throat> yeah, so I'll give you an example. For, uh, we have a test that we created. It's a simple scenario-based thing that we're, we're building at AWS. We use Storyline because um, we know that it works. So in technically, you can go in and hard code all the questions and build like, let's say 30, 40 questions and then you're done. But we have some restrictions. One is that we would like to update this without going and touching Storyline again. We would also like to uh, translate these easily. We also wanna make sure that we can pick on the fly certain parts of these questions based on a group. So the, the easiest thing for us was just basically separate the two. You can create the simple logic in Storyline, only four screens, and store all the assessment in an XML file outside. And it loads it, and it shows you and walks you through the assessment. If you wanna change something, you just change the XML file. You can send it to your reviewers, um, change the text, nobody cares, put it back again and it works without, again, republishing or touching any of those. So that's one way to think about how you separate logic, UI, and then content at the same time. Beautiful, and just to just to reiterate that, because I wanna make, like, that's that's really cool for some people. I wanna make sure everyone heard that. Like, Joel, yeah, we, they made this thing at AWS. Storyline, the programming is all there. There's some code to query this text file, essentially, and, and what Jolt is saying is now, if you wanna make changes to that text, you wanna translate the text, you just open up that text file, change the text there, and it's updated, just like that. Storyline is pulling it from there. You don't need to republish. All you do is press save, and there you have it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you hear there's about a that little a lot. More, yeah, there's a little more into it, but yes. Because <laughs> unfortunately, LMS doesn't sometimes work that way that you can just yeah. update one file, but in technically you could just um, create one file as the um, owner of all the um, ingredients for your assessment. Now, this is not just the text of what's in it, but also imagine this is, this is where programming thinking comes in of, how do you create a standalone item that has all the um, attributes? So let's say it has a title, has a subject or a body. It has whether it's true or false or how many points you get for that. What's the ranking? What is if you miss it, the feedback? What is the follow-up scenario if you um, need a follow-up scenario? All these in the one little piece and then just use them, store them in an XML somewhere else. Nice, okay. But it's just another one of those examples of, yeah, do the hard thinking in the beginning, figure out this system, think about how you can make it super efficient going forward. So then it's like you're, you're, you make that initial investment and it's just so much easier making the changes and the updates down the line. So yep. that, that's kind of how I view development, you know, JavaScript development in some way. It's like this huge upfront investment of like learning it, or at least it was for me, like definitely a sizable investment. But now it like pays off on every client project I do because there aren't many people who who have this skill set, so it, you can charge some really nice project fees for doing that type of work. Um, because yeah, most e-learning developers, if they don't have that skill set, they'll say it's impossible. So um, good stuff there. Before I moved on from this question, I did just want to add a few more resources about how to learn JavaScript and custom code. There were a few that really helped me. I think Free Code Camp is where I started. It was free. It gets you and introduces you to the basics and introduces some projects that you can build. Um, a really cool one, though, that I found a little later on, I wish I would have found earlier, is called Scrimba. So that's S-C-R-I-M-B-A dot com. And that one, similar to JS Fiddle, it's kind of like you're watching a screencast. The instructor is like talking over it, explaining the code as he writes it, and there's a browser over here. But the cool thing about this is that anytime you can pause the screencast, edit the code on the screen, and see the changes it makes in the browser. So once they introduce a concept, you can just make all the changes you want, really make sure you, you know, practice with it. And then you just press play and it jumps back to where they were in the video. So it, it was so, it was really cool. And there are some good, um, really good JavaScript courses on there. So I just wanted to throw those two suggestions out before we moved on to a new question. But good conversation, we're jumping all over the place. Um, <laughs> this next most updated one is, I think you've already answered this a bit. It's about, you know, do you recommend that all e-learning developers learn JavaScript? But you're kind of saying, 
unless you unless you dive into it, you find that you actually like it, you really enjoy this technical side of things, diving into the code, it might be a bad idea to learn JavaScript and to put it out there that you know JavaScript because then you might get jobs that ask you to do it every day. If you And if you hate it, <laughs> it's not going to be a good time. <laughs> So uh, we have uh, at, at Amazon, we have one of our principles is a so-called two two door, two way door um, decision. When you can go in, see what it looks like, feels like, and as long as you can step back and there's not no harm, then why don't you just try it? So it's not a decision of yes, no. Um, it is a decision more like how far, and then see if it's worth it. So set aside some time and say, OK, I'm going to spend X amount of hours and see if this is something for me or not. Um, but one thing I strongly suggest is start with something that that fits your style. Because, um, and this is what you get very opinionated people on LinkedIn when you ask whether you need to have JavaScript or not. If someone really knows JavaScript, they say this is the best you have to have. If someone doesn't, they might say, like, no, um, because you don't need that. Just go to someone who's professional. So the, the point of, of this is that if you're a person who go to Ikea and buys furniture and opens that wonderful black and white thing <laughs> and start with page one of like, okay, let's see, we have one screw here, this size, make sure that I have and you spread it out. If you're that type of person, start with that sort of learning, the basics outside of storyline, the basics of, of understanding the fundamentals of how it works, what it is. If you're the person who like, I don't care about the ingredients, what is step one and start building, then you're gonna be frustrated with those type of courses when you start with what's a variable, what is an array, that sort of thing. Then jump in and start building things. And then as you go, learn. But either way, find what you, who you are and how you learn best, because otherwise you're gonna give up very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it helped, it helped me a lot trying to learn those fundamentals, learn the core language, and then actually start building something. And you're going to have to Google something like every 10 minutes. <laughs> and then you'll you'll find resources that you don't understand. And then you'll come back a week later and just, it, it is, it's tough, right? Like, it's, it's not easy when you actually do get into building the projects, but um, having that foundational language really helps. Yeah, so on top of that, your biggest friend will be Stack Overflow. So if you don't know yes. what Stack Overflow is, it's basically the magic place when all the questions in the world has been asked and answered. Yes. <laughs> there is not one question I had ever that wasn't answered already somewhere on Stack Overflow. It's basically the website, Stack Overflow. And what it's amazing, and this is why part of uh, its gamification is that um, that site has been around for a long time because they they actually achieve what many uh, failed at. Um, they What they did was, and now everybody has this, I think, feature, is that they're not promoting and rewarding um, people who post. They're rewarding the right answers. So what that brings in is if you ask a question, a lot of people come in and chime in. You as a poster say, this is the best answer. And others can up and down vote. So what happens is that you get this social status of I've been answering questions and I have a higher status, which brings people in to help others. They have this cycle of people donating their time to answer questions and they don't get anything for it. Yeah. Um, but it's an amazing that every time you have any question, the first, even just Google it, the first one probably a stack over. Exactly. Code, yep. Um, answer. Yes, so that's, I, I get the impression from talking to more experienced developers that the Googling and spending the time on Stack Overflow is just like part of the job. So you're probably gonna be Googling much more basic questions when you're starting out, but it sounds like all developers kind of are just looking things up and spending their time on Stack Overflow to figure out how to solve their problems. More of it will become you know, second nature as you go, but it's always, always learning, it sounds like, so. And the one thing that you're gonna learn there is that it's not one way always of how you solve things. Right. Uh, this is, I think, a big, I think, takeaway, the, the difference between efficacy and um, effective and efficiency. So when you start out, your goal is not to be perfect. It's like you go to a country, uh, a new language. Your goal is not to be perfect in the language. 
but usually have the goal of not to be sold and not to be misunderstood critically. That's the level that you're looking for. And then after that, you can polish. So the same with, with JavaScript, um, you're gonna hear a lot of things like, oh, that should be done this way or that way because it's more efficient. Yeah. They, we're not on the level. We're not building thousands and thousands of lines of code and it should be efficient because that might be a one millisecond um, faster way to do that. We're just gonna get the job done most of the time yes. with, with Storyline. Great example, good, good, good. Okay, let me see. I think we had a relevant follow-up question to that. I wanna find it. Okay, so this is a slightly different angle on that question. So when you are looking at applicants, so instructional designers or e-learning developers looking for work, do they stand out if they have this front-end development or JavaScript skill set? Assuming they've been in the field for a few years, like I don't think we expect like new people coming into the field to have this skill set. But yeah, where where does that play into things when you're evaluating new hires? Or does it depend on the role you're trying to fill? It is really a, a role in a team. So this is, um, you have, and maybe it's again, it's a question of, of where you like to work. There are different, I think, types of work. You can be in a large company when you're part of a team, 20, 30, 40 designers and developers, um, and everybody does one thing. So you have people who are taking care of your graphics, other taking care of coding and technical stuff, and you're designing or um, one tool. You can also work for a small agency um, or a nonprofit sort of thing when you do everything. This is where I, I, I get a lot of, of comments from that I'm a one person department and I just solve one thing for them and they think um, that I'm a, a genius. Um, and all I did was just copy paste something from a code and put it in and now it works. So it depends on where um, and what sort of um, uh, role it is. And also what I think their team dynamics are so if they do need someone who's more technical, um, they like that. Good point, right. And I, 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 I've noticed in some positions that like Amazon and AWS, like one of the nice to haves I've seen popping up is like XAPI or like HTML, CSS, JavaScript. But it seems like in a lot of cases, it's nice to have, unless you are doing something where you're gonna be in there coding on like a daily basis. That's the impression I get at least. And I would say more uh, on a resume, if you actually tell what problem you solved, um, what was the business problem or work with a client of uh, what was seemed to be impossible and you solved it rather than just, I have a skill of using X yeah. X X or JavaScript. Sometimes your manager has no idea of what JavaScript is. True. Um, they just wanna make sure that they bring on someone who can do X, Y, Z and it said, hey, I can do more than just out of the box. Great point. Okay, good. So not just making about your skills, talk about the, the real problems you can solve and have solved. I like, I like that. Okay. So looking at the next questions, I think we've probably already answered this one pretty well. The benefits of using JavaScript with Storyline, you've kind of listed the tiers of benefits. You can work more efficiently because you can use fewer triggers. You can create some really cool types of interactions that wouldn't be possible otherwise. You can collect data really specific data from these learning experiences that are not possible that's not possible out of the box um again that efficiency you can kind of separate those concerns do all of your programming in here and then you can store the content somewhere else make it super easy to update and am i missing any any are right, am i missing any big ones benefits um and just like i think the apis of you can connect to any other system the lms is obvious because you put it somewhere um, but there are other things that, that gives you uh, a way to connect, um, whether it's within your little package or outside, um, right. like a web, web uh, object. So sometimes, for example, a web object doesn't actually have to be on the screen. Uh, so example would be uh, some kind of a library that helps you calculate distance and physics and whatever it is. It's not for the user to see, it's for you to get um, the input and output. And now you're magical because you can build a house and it actually knows when to get from one place to another and there's an open door or a closed door because you have these little, little things going on in the background that kind of mimics. So all these things that doesn't really have to be on screen, sometimes backend sort of 
behind the scene magic that you can nice. do in JavaScript. Great. Yeah. Okay, good. Very helpful. Cool. And I think we have time for a couple of more questions. We'll see if there's anything highly uploaded that we haven't covered. Um, this question is, can you use JavaScript or custom code to extend other other e-learning authoring tools as well? So it sounds like anywhere you can you can add that JavaScript, anywhere you can maybe modify that HTML file, you would be able to use some of these features. Um, yeah, so in in my 20 years, I only seen like four major tools. Um, Captivate was a long time friend for me for simulation, that sort of thing it was really buggy. Um, so I kind of dropped it until they started redoing it and refreshing it. Um, Storyline and the whole like 360 is one of them. Lector was another one. Um, and then you have other ones with like SAS sort of um, right. things. So most of them allow some sort of a JavaScript. Um, how it works with the actual authoring tool is very different. So in Storyline, if you're even not even familiar with that, so Storyline, when you when you actually publish your your work and go to a browser, it actually creates uh, what they call the player. It's almost like in the browser there sits something that's called Storyline and it handles everything. So you don't really see inside of what's happening. It just handles the screen and interactions and that sort of thing. That's the output. JavaScript is not inside that thing. You can't get inside. It's sitting on the browser somewhere outside. And so what you have to learn is how to talk between the two, which is very simple. Once you do a couple of um, you know, examples, you see how they can talk to each other. So the, the, this JavaScript is sitting outside in the browser. It's not actually inside your, your storyline thing. Oh, good. Yeah, good. Good distinction, and I guess the the flip side of that would be something like Rise, where the output for that you can see all of the HTML, you can see all of the CSS if you want, and you can add a JavaScript file to kind of hook into those things because it's all exposed in the browser. Um, and that would be the fifth layer, which we didn't really talk about the hacks. Um, the hacks. <laughs> so the the hacks is like the thing that you're not supposed to be doing. Uh, but yeah. for whatever reason, that's the only way to solve and the client needs that, you can. So for example, RISE, when you go to the POP99, there's a couple of RISE examples of how to add JavaScript post um, exporting. So you're not going to break RISE per se. You can export it as is. But add a little bit of manual thing, add a JavaScript into that. And so an example would be ask your name, you type in what your nickname is, and then actually use that inside Rise. Um, I also did that for customizing what you need in Rise, hiding some of the chapters, showing other things. So a lot of things that you can do once you understand how the structure is, but that's a hack. Nice. So the fifth layer are the hacks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, because again, JavaScript really language of the modern web, it seems. So if it's a web-based experience, like there's probably some way to hack it if you have access to that output folder and you can run JavaScript when it launches. Nice. And then uh, on just one more note on that, because I know that people asked all about this different types of, of uh, frameworks uh, and what the heck is a framework. So there is JavaScript inside every browser that is built in. And sometimes they refer to it as vanilla, like basic JavaScript. There's nothing in it um, just as it comes by the standard. And it understands JavaScript code. But programmers obviously realize that there are certain tasks that over and over and over again needs to be done. And how nice it would be if someone actually build, pre-build these things that I can just use. It's almost like building a house from a footprint that's already created and just add the pieces. So these are the frameworks like Angular and um, React and all that. It's all JavaScript based, but they are good for a specific problem solving um, problem or challenge. But you need to understand JavaScript under it because otherwise you're going to have a hard time to, to use them. So that's like a, a different, I think, topic because then we really get into uh, which one works on the front end, back end, and yeah, that sort of yeah. But the general idea, yeah, there's vanilla JavaScript that gets updated every X amount of years. That's that's what you know. That's what you, where you should start. But then there are people who build libraries on top of that. They write a bunch of code so that you can use all of their code with just like one line. 
you know, they make functions yeah. so that it's easier for you to take advantage of those without having to write it all again from scratch. But like Joel said, start with vanilla, yeah. start with the basics. Start with That's the basics, good. understand that. Um, I know that we're um, getting to the top of the hour. And before we run out of time, I, I know Devlin was very nice. He said, um, I don't want to give you homework. Uh, but I know there's a lot of things happened in the chat that uh, we can get to or um, questions. Find me on LinkedIn and ask me your questions. And if I know the answer, I'll tell you. If not, I'll find someone. I'm going to make sure that everybody gets something out of this conversation because I've seen the, the ranges from people who've never seen JavaScript all the way to what's better, Angular or Boo and React. <laughs> Well, I, there, yeah, there are questions diving into that. Nice. Well, that is very nice of you because we know you are a very busy man. So no, I didn't say I'm answering all the questions. I just said connect with me on LinkedIn. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> nice. Okay, we have a few minutes. Do we want to? Do you want to tell us about another project you did? I see we have a question here from Claudette, JavaScript programmer. Um, they're intrigued with the possibilities of storyline in JavaScript. What is the coolest thing you've done? You've already told us about some really cool things, but um, any others that come to mind before we wrap this up? Um, so I think it depends on how you define cool. Um, <laughs> True. So my <laughs> my solutions, what usually is we cannot do X for the client, and then I came in and said, yeah, we could, but let's sit down and talk through it. Whether we we want to do that, and is the client okay with it? So one thing uh, that we, we built is it was for a um, onboarding when, when Storyline was the base, when they learned about the timeline and all that, but they can get into actual rooms inside. So there was a history room, there was a culture room and that sort of thing. And that used a lot of JavaScript um, to make it personal and you interact with objects and collect things. Um, as you went through, rather than just um, the sheer JavaScript. And uh, one we, uh, weird, I think, request I get one once is there was a client who wanted to use a test, but it was a time test. So you had, let's say, 20 minutes to get through that. Even if you close the window and you came back, it, it should count the time. So what I had to do is actually um, do a little trick in JavaScript to to measure what the last time they used it, what the next time to run it, figure out what the time difference is, and whether they're within that time frame or not. So there was wow. a lot of like work around to one little thing to solve this problem that they wanted time, absolutely timed stress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's when you start thinking about how it needs to work across devices and browsers and everything things can get tricky, how you're holding that information, how you're accessing it. But great examples. Thank you for sharing all of this with us. Yeah, let's get a big thanks for Schultz joining us here today and offering to answer follow-up questions on LinkedIn. So I think I will share your, I mean, people will find you. It's Schultz Ola. I'll share your LinkedIn link as well, just so people can connect with you there. I'm sure many of you already know Schultz and are connected with him, but just in case there is the link and I will talk to you all soon. Thanks again, Jolt. Uh, we'll talk soon as well. Thank you so much and see you everyone. Good night, wherever you are. Bye-bye. <laughs>